Hi everybody, my name is Alan. On behalf of the crew, I'd like to welcome you to another edition of Bridging Heaven and Earth. Well, you know, it's it's just an amazing time. I mean, we've we've been doing this show for ten years now, and we've been doing the show through seemingly all the all the consequences of the human condition. We've been doing it through love and war and coming together and coming apart and nations growing and nations falling apart and at this particular time in history it seems we've been saying you know while we've been setting up for this show this seems like there's a natural disaster literally every nine minutes that every nine minutes there's something happening where whole cities whole areas literally whole countries are being wiped out and people are leaving the planet people are being born and people are leaving the planet and at the heart of all of it always for the whole 10 years and now and now when there's such intensity and such upheaval and such in a sense seeming trauma on the planet the heart of love beats and beats and beats and beats and each one of us can feel it, whether we feel it all the time, or whether we feel it at night, or whether we feel it at a sunset, or with our lover. We know in our hearts, in our deepest heart of hearts, that there is a love that connects us all. Some of us call it God, some of us call it other things. But we know that there's a connection, we know that there's a power, a love, That is what we truly are. And all the rest of it have so little weight in the consequence of that truth, of that love, of that connection. And yet here on earth, some of the time, we forget that. And Bridging Heaven and Earth, the television show, from the very beginning, was to, to sing the praises of that love was to have guests from all over the world who come in and all the different ways that they express that love and in all the different ways that their love and motion moves from psychics and healers and singers and musicians and artists and writers and everyone dancers and just everyone has come here to say that that love exists and that I want more of it. And in this time of seeming intensity, we can also feel the cleansing happening. That that which needs to be cleaned and how the earth needs to readjust itself is happening. And that love is rising. And we want to celebrate it. And that's why the crew comes together. That's why all the guests come. And we have guests tonight who flew in literally just to do the show. Hundreds and thousands of miles to share their love, to share their gift, to say, I want to celebrate that connection. I want to call forth in my life and all the lives around me all of my brothers and sisters on the planet that that love exists and we're honored tonight to have Kathy Scarra with us Patricia Gognick I mean they're extraordinary humanitarians artists they're involved with numerous art humanitarian connection love projects When you see their art, and they're also involved as people who've been watching Bridging recently know that we're involved with the Bridging Heaven and Earth Art Project. And they immediately said, yes, we want to participate. We want to produce a piece based on the theme Bridging Heaven and Earth. And their pieces that they produced for that are here, and you'll see them tonight, and they're extraordinary. They're just love in motion, love put on canvas, oneness exploding. 
And don't we need to come together in that love? Don't we need to come together in that explosion? Because if we don't, we'll miss the opportunity to be in the Garden of Eden on this planet, to make, to return our experience to that righteousness, that oneness, that love. It really is love if you experience it in the human body. It really is joy. And what do we want to experience as humans except that love and that joy? That's not dependent on all the other things. And we also have, as we normally do, some videos tonight. And Kathy uh, has put together an extraordinary video called Emergence that talks about how her art comes through, how it manifests, how it's her expression of that oneness, of that connection, of that love. And you'll see her art, you'll see how it's created, you'll see people talking about it. So join me in a short meditation, settle in. The joy is there, the love is, the love is there. We get back, we'll have Patricia and Kathy with us, and it's an opportunity. So join me in a short meditation, then we'll have the video. Okay, thank you. So we're going to start tonight's show with uh, Kathy Skerritt's video, Emergence. It's the first half. I mean, it's an ex ex exploration of art, of consciousness, of oneness, of love. Kathy's video, Emergence. When I'm looking at art, I'm not looking as an interior decorator. Uh, I'm looking at the art as, how does it fit with me, with my thinking? When I look at Kathy's paintings, I suppose the image goes through my eyes to my brain. That's what's rational. But actually what I sense, what I understand is it goes straight to my heart. I felt like in Kathy's work, there is a, it's a representation of a mind, body and spirit. I was uh, 13 years old when I traveled with my family to India, and that was part of a larger trip that we took that began in so South Africa and went through Kenya and Tanzania and then through India. I spent hours looking out windows of airplanes, struck by the obvious repetition of patterns from uh, one country to the next and from one kind of geography to the next on the basis of color and smell and music and mo the movement of the people and the patterns of all of this playing out in the streets of India itself. I was extremely seduced by and attracted to Indian culture. And it was the place where I really became aware that uh, there are holy people in every land and that there could not possibly be a single point of view about God and the divine that was the only truth about that. I think one thing I really like about her art is that um, there is so much her faith and you know the divinity and the higher power she talks and both me and my husband you know, come from a culture and a country where we believe those kind of things and we were able to really, um, some sort of a bond we felt between us and her artwork. Kathy's art, when I looked at it the first time, you know, it, it gave me a great feeling of uh, spirituality. And I could see that, you know, there are paintings which were talking to me. You know, I looked at it as a Shakti. Shakti means energy. Now, Kathy started describing her feelings, and some were 
we we had the meeting of meeting of the hearts. My favorite piece is the one that I want to buy next. <laughs> um, I own four pieces of Kathy's art, and it's not enough. I often start with a specific idea of a, a form, an image, or a, a particular communication I would like to make and, and follow that. And sometimes I don't have that, but I have an impulse. Uh, or I know that I want to paint something today that I need to do that. On the days when my mind has no content that I respect or that moves me, uh, I will use one of the techniques I learned in graduate school at Ursuline College. And one of the techniques that we used would be is to simply feel into what color feels like you today. What color f evokes an emotional response today? And I would take that color and make a mark. And then I would enter into a consideration about what that mark appears to be to me. And then the next color would suggest itself, or the next form would suggest itself, or the next tool to move it around would suggest itself. And so sometimes it's a completely subjective process. Hi everybody, welcome back. So that was some beautiful video. We'll see more of it a little later. Uh, so in between us, obviously this is uh, Kathy and Patricia, but in between us is uh, Kathy's piece for the Bridging Heaven and Earth Art Project. Is that an explosion or something? So why don't you talk a little bit about, you know, how kind of, you know, love and motion came through you for that because I'm sure that everybody's just looking at it and going, wow. Why don't you talk about yeah, that? Sure. Um, it, it's been an interesting process, Alan, because earlier this year I had heart surgery. And I've often thought about not just the physical heart and how it functions to keep me alive as a being in the world, but also the heart as an archetype, uh, as, as a symbol of that which is greater than my sort of merely mortal human capacity to, to understand love. Um, so this whole subject of, of the heart being um, uh, that which keeps me alive, uh, and then also the heart being that which um, allows for the transcendent to manifest itself into the world is, is something that is very important to me. So when you asked me if I would be interested in participating in the Bridging Heaven and Earth Artist Initiative, um, I thought, okay, that, that's what it is that I have to do. I have to address this partly because of the broader uh, transcendent meaning of the heart itself, but also because it's a healing process that I have been going through and it's 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 this process I've been going through is most fundamental to my, my understanding about love altogether. And life. And life, absolutely. And so um, I have over the years, over 27, 28 years, I've worked with the circle as, as a motif, as an archetype quite a bit. It's something that almost, it's, it's almost kind of obnoxious. I, I can't get away from it. Um, when I don't know what to paint, the circle is always there. And if you look across cultures, there uh, are mandalas everywhere over time and uh, among people of very disparate uh, traditions and it's often the the form by which cultures manifest their maps of the heavens as they understand them and it's a, an archetype of wholeness uh, uh, it is a sign of generativity all of those things which are different forms of what i've come to understand as the heart itself so it seemed appropriate uh, in this case to consider in a visual form the heart as that which transcends or bridges heaven and earth and the heart itself when it it's fully manifested uh, actually dissolves any sense of difference between heaven and earth and when i work with an essentially monochromatic palette like what you see here it's primarily a green palette uh, and there's an object in the midst of of that palette what I'm trying to convey is that really ultimately there is no difference between the object and the environment in which it arises. So there is no difference. It's the oneness. Yeah, it's absolutely the oneness. And so visually, the palette is, is a way to, to try to convey that. And, and you, for you, Patricia, I mean, I, I've seen a lot of your stuff and it has that same, I mean, we'll see one of them, you know, in the next segment. Uh, you know, when we put that up, well, that'll be in between us. But I mean, you have a, you know, a slightly different 
almost take on it. Why don't you explain the way you manifest your love and that connection to the oneness and that striving and experiencing and of you know through your art. Thank you, Alan. I, I really truly believe that we all have with great purpose. Uh, the desire to express ourselves in a way that is artistic or creative, whether it be through music or sculpture, and having the opportunity to actually be able to put your emotions and feelings, find the saj, the old wisdom within yourself, and the connectivity that we have to the field of energy and light that exists on the planet at the present time, and with the, the field of changes and with our ability to recognize them, be in higher consciousness, and at the same time, outside of our ego, try to develop something that will meet the expectations of ourselves, and as well, the expectations that the viewer of our work will be able to receive and hopefully manifest. Wow, and, and at some point, both of you I know have come to, to feel that you wanted your art in a way to serve, to serve you know, with us, the Bridging Heaven Earth Foundation, but also you came together and the way we met you was through the Colors of Freedom. Why don't, you know, why don't you talk about it and then we'll go to Kathy, talk about her involvement and what that meant to you and how art became a, like just love and motion and a humanitarian experience for you. Um, a, a little bit of the background, um, myself as an artist and also a business person, and uh, I had the opportunity to study in France for the past seven years with a master, Dragan Dragic in Savoyon. And what he taught me was basically that you needed to release from yourself that which is negative, that which does not serve you because you are not serving other persons. So it's almost as if that old saying of what you see in me that you don't like is what you don't like in yourself. So when you paint, you can only paint from that place that develops that goodness. Um, my uh, work, of course, I'm trying very hard to be expressive enough that I am seen around the world. And I did have the opportunity to meet with people in Toronto. Joe Catalano is an artist who also has a, an academic background. And he developed the um, portfolio idea after 911. And he and Donna Penrice, a poet, put a book together. They sold it to raise money for the victims of 911. Afterwards, he created this organization and said, why don't we put a portfolio of paintings together? And I was invited to it and helped them to develop bringing in artists of uh, great caliber, including a Los Angeles artist, um, Andre Mirapolsky, and some American artists that are very important, Frederick Hart, who is deceased, but a, a very important sculptor. So through this portfolio, my role as executive director it took me to England. We were able to have a meeting with Prince Andrew, HRH, Duke of York, and invited him to participate in the portfolio. So we do have one of his photographs as well. There are 20 uh, prints, 100 editions, and we're selling them to raise money for uh, children's peace initiatives. So the theme for us is actually quite universal. Well, and, and you're also involved in that, right, Kat? I'm one of the participating artists, and one of the reasons that it appealed to me was that it was such a, a strong, well-organized and um, effort, and in, in, in children's peace initiatives are, are something that are very dear to my heart. But as an artist, you know, I, I paint images that could easily simply be mere self-reflection. You know, my, I have a spiritual teacher, Adi Dal Samraj, and he talks about Narcissus as the archetype for the ego and, and the self-contraction out of relationship that the ego does out of its fear and uh, of mortality or its sense of separateness. And if I don't put the art into the service of something which is greater than that, which is greater than the ego, then my paintings, my canvases are just sort of the pond uh, within which I, as Narcissus, uh, Narcissus, am gazing at my own reflection. And that serves nothing but to um, turn energy in on itself and to maintain the sense of separation from the world. And I really believe that for art to be most healing and useful, that it has to, it has to go beyond itself and evoke the participation of the viewer in a process that actually changes their reality, takes them into a place never thought of before. And to that end, uh, I show my work and take advantage of every opportunity I can to engage directly with the people who are viewing it. So that won't be possible in the case of every portfolio that is acquired, but uh, 
it is an opportunity for me to be able to say these very things in a variety of different ways around the portfolio project to elicit uh, a different kind of participation. What do you think about, and both of you I'd like you to, to respond to, I mean about like a painting have a certain energy, a certain mm -hmm. intention, a certain energy, and by itself, you know, it's almost like vibrating because it's all energy and you know everything about its energy and you used your energy on it. Why don't you talk a little bit how you feel about that? Go ahead, Kathy. Well, it, it's a, an interesting uh, thing to think about when, when people come to my studio and stand in front of a piece. Often they are not familiar or they are uncomfortable with abstract work and they're a little um, maybe shy about saying what it is they're feeling or w what definition they're bringing to it. And my response is always that if you will take responsibility for your response, your engagement with the piece, and if you will pass that on in some way to another, you enlarge the space that that image or that piece occupies in the culture, and you allow uh, for there to be room for other people to bring themselves to it. Now that being said, the painting itself, by virtue of what's going on with color relationships and form, has to be such that it will it will uh, that the vibration of it evokes that kind of bodily response that I'm looking for. It's like, for instance, um, putting co certain colors up against each other, like reds and greens. There's a natural vibration that takes place, and hopefully it will not permit you to stay in your head about it, but you will actually get below the neck and have a whole bodily response. And if that occurs, then we've entered into the realm of true feeling as opposed to just a cerebral response. Thinking. Yeah. And if we get into that feeling place, we approach our true capacity to actually be in authentic relationship with each other, because that's a feeling matter. How and, can you, you neither know, of you ever thought about your art? Oh my lord, you girls are good. <laughs> no, really, it's, it's really amazing to hear you talk about it, because, yeah, you know, there's so much power to it, but obviously your intention is behind that. Mm -hmm. And you're really approaching each new canvas with that intention. And, you know, like, like we've talked about before, and I've talked about it on the show a lot, that's how we approach the show, yes. with that intention. Yeah. So it's, you know, so why don't you tell us a little bit about yours? <laughs> well, I, I think that everything is probably as um, complex as it is simple. Mm -hmm. And that uh, if we are, in fact, able to say, as I exist, I need to know that I am in my own faith, in my own truth, always with great abundance, in love with all things around me, that I am harmonious with nature, whether it's an ant or a fly or it's my glasses, it makes no difference because there is no way for us to differentiate something that we do not have the recipe for, the alchemical uh, journey. So at this point in my work, all that comes out of me is what I am able to receive by going to that quietude within and assuming that my gift is that while I'm here on this earth in, in the magnitude of you know, the voyage that I have chosen to be in at this time, I'm able to receive and accept and love and honor all that is around me and in nature, all aspects of that. So that everything does vibrate, the physics, the sacred geometry, the Fibonacci, all of those things are actually guiding and gifting us, but only when you choose to search yourself deep enough if it's your time. Wow. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. You know, I mean, you know, it's interesting because you wonder sometimes why certain people, I mean, and both of you are trained, so I mean, you know, you, there's a certain learning process you did, but I mean, clearly that, you know, the heart and mind are coming together to produce this explosion of love. I mean, it's not, it's not as random. <laughs> As it looks, I mean, the way you guys are describing it is so clear and so right on and so intentional. But I that think it's beautiful. Our, for myself, I know that you have to have experienced life and you have to have experienced many aspects of life, recognize them, and then identify with them how important or how unimportant they truly have been in your accordance and in, in how you choose to bring yourself to your next level and then the impact that you have on your fellow mankind and you cannot do that if you come here as a new soul you come here as an old soul then those are things that are easy for you to identify recognize and and it just makes that easier for you so you do have a gift to leave we, we are actually performing 
here so that God can know himself in his most benevolent way. Mm, I like that. Thank and you. and the, the, the thing that that triggered for me was that, you know, I, I've been a, a, a fan, um, I guess is a, is a good enough word, of, of Jung, uh, the psychoanalyst and who was a student Freud. And, you know, his whole concept of, of making the unconscious conscious. I think that artists in this day and age uh, function a little differently than artists in the days when art was essentially a sacred function. It was created to be in sacred space and served a, a very obviously religious or spiritual purpose. And now we have an extremely commercial world um, where art is removed from the context in which it was created. And, and often that, that sacred component is either lost or it's never there to begin with. And um, going back to Jung, this whole notion of making the unconscious conscious, I, I see artists as having the possibility of taking on the, the, um, the purpose of serving as sort of spiritual or um, imagistic midwives, okay, to the culture, um, of, of, of taking an image uh, and presenting it as a living entity, even. Because for me, th this is a living entity. This thing is alive, and my relationship with it, this painting, is a revelation process that goes out over time. And I think that um, uh, rightly done in, in, in a disposition of, of surrender and, and relationship, uh, any piece of art can assume that transcendent function um, and, and be evocative of the sacred and, and a new point of view, if you will, um, within the culture altogether. Is that, was that, yeah, that's what I want to say. Uh, you know, it would seem to me that, you know, when somebody's having the experience of that, it's going to manifest and whether, you know, your gift is through art or through sculpture or through a television show or through being a mother or a school teacher or a garbage cleaner. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's like to have that experience. <laughs> Once you have that experience, it's going to manifest because yeah. you're in a physical body and you're going to do physical. We were talking about that a little mm -hmm. earlier. I think, you know, you know, maybe there are some, you know, Hindus or, you know, people who are going to be in the caves and stay there. But for most Westerners, they're going to take action. So, the, you know, mm -hmm. we talk about that uh, there's only one problem on the planet is that people are, aren't having the experience of the love, of the oneness. That's it. You know, and every, that's the root. And then from there, yeah. you know, all hell breaks loose. Mm -hmm. But how can we heal the heart? How can we heal the root? And that's, you know, through all these different vibrational means of, you know, it's like, was it your painting, yours, Bridging Show 161, you know, mm -hmm. a talk given by a teacher, a guru, and then all of a sudden the Berlin Wall falls. What yeah. caused it? Yes. Mm -hmm. You don't know, but it doesn't matter because it's down. And there's more love. 100 monkey. Yeah, right. the 100th monkey, right. right, exactly. Yeah, and, and something that you were saying there about um, relationship, and I'm sorry, I, I lost my track of thought right there. It'll come back to me. But okay. it had to do with the relational. Well, maybe you knew it. <laughs> 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 so psychic. Who's, who's talking who's who's not, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, with Going back to the colors of freedom, I, I think the purpose behind our endeavor of, a, of a, an art portfolio was to take the universal purpose of love and say, okay, if we use these particular artists who can be identified worldwide that are rare and unique and have given us that intent, we then reseed the good work with people who get to, to benefit, and then the monies that we have uh, received and will receive are going to go to the, the three organizations that are outright that we sponsor. And then in addition to that, there are a number of other uh, orphanages and schools. But I'd like to just note the, the three primary. Okay, and sure, then um, Free the Children, which was an organization founded to, uh, 10 years ago by Craig Kilberger when he was 12 years old. Uh, Craig decided that there were people in this earth that were doing projects that uh, work in, in foreign countries that was slave labor young boys and so he decided to take his time in the basement got his class together raised money and and went over and, and started his initiative right afterwards um, he after doing this he has 400 schools he's in 35 countries has affected over a million uh, children uh, round square school uh, founded by Kurt Hahn also taking the personal objective of people and saying it can go over and above the school. Classroom Connection, putting books into the schools, 80% funding. And 
all of that coming all the way back out all relates to, to children because that's where the love and the change has to transpire. Shoes for the Soul, of course you will have Karen Morrissey here, another organization that unless we pay attention to the good will, the good effort, and be in higher consciousness, right mindedness at all times, these things won't happen. So I think the vehicles that we use are when we have that ability to take the art, our lessons, and move them forward so they identify and reach out in more than one way. Wow, that's beautiful. Okay, so I think maybe what we'll do now is go to the uh, second half of, of Kathy's video. I'm sure you're anxious to see it because I know the first half was fantastic and the second half because I've seen it is, is magnificent. It's Kathy's video emergence. I've only been moved by art in this same powerful way once before, and that was the first time I ever saw Georgia O'Keeffe's works. But not until I saw Kathy's work did I have the same powerful reaction to art. The colors are layered, and they come from one another. They're the colors of the earth. They're the colors of the sky. They're the colors of crying. They're the colors of laughing. I like to refer to color as the, the first seduction. Uh, color is an extremely critical component. And what I'm trying to do with color is to introduce the idea that there is, first of all, light, illumination from within the apparent object. This idea of inner illumination is, is completely fundamental to what I feel and believe uh, is the case about the divine, which is number one, there is only the divine and that is conscious light. The second compositional element that's really important uh, is texture, surface, and I consider um, my textured surfaces as the second seduction because they are so physical uh, that people are very impulse to touch the surfaces. I personally like artwork where, you know, I could feel, you know, rather than just looking at a print, you know, of something, of the original. So I was able to actually touch and feel and see, you know, the neck and the, the body, the hair, you know. Her texture seems to boil up and out of the canvas and those paints just seem to be coming at you and they're grabbing you. There's a lot of motion from a canvas. There are several movements uh, and, and specific artists who in, have influenced me artistically, and um, I found the Cubist to be extraordinarily intriguing. The Cubist would address the presentation of an object from multiple points of view. In my consideration of that, I've come to this place of what are then the multiple states of being of an object that could be presented simultaneously. And in my familiarity with the media in which I work and, and the way that I work with it now, you might see in a single painting these different states. You might see geologic, along with an anatomical, along with a biological, uh, metallic, and fluid. This painting is called Dissolution. And um, according to Kathy, she was trying to portray an uh, old man's face. Now, when I think about old man, I think that, you know, here is a person who has lived a good life, obviously, you know. He survived 80, 90 years, you know, he must have done something good. That's the first positive note that comes to me, my, my mind. And again, uh, if you see, the face is old, but there are so many, you know, the, the other colors around that man, you know, the gold, the green, you know. And then again, that leaves a lot of, uh, you know, other positive notes, the passion, you know, the things uh, uh, we do in life. In Indian mythology, they say there's a door here, the tenth door. We have nine openings in our body. The tenth is here. The tenth door, that's on Dwar, is that's where you get the enlightenment. So, in Katis, Transfiguration. One day I see an eagle, my eagle, in there, and I see that eagle slowly melting. It's melting, melting within the atmosphere, and that that was phenomenal for me. 
think that the purpose of art ultimately is the establishment of equanimity and the creation of a healing response in the body that allows again for people to come into relationship with each other in an unobstructed way. As an art collector, first of all you want to beautify your home space. Kathy's art has done that in our home. But more than that, it must cause a continuing effect emotionally inside you. Any work of art really is purely personal originally, whether you're a writer or a painter, but once it's out there, then it becomes a gift to the world. Art is something to me, when I look at it, it reflects my beliefs. It reflects uh, something which strengthens me. Also, the art should inspire a person to, to do certain positive things, you know. I've had the experience of a particular piece of my peacock mandala, which is currently in a private collection in New York. Uh, it was shown at the International Art Exposition in New York this past February, February of 2004. And there were people from China, Iran, Afghanistan, and Turkey, none of whom spoke English, but who at various times during the course of the weekend stood in front of this piece and were profoundly responsive to it and even to the point of tears and so there is this possibility of the work transcending cultural boundaries and the limitations of culture and the limitations of language and in the same way um, i think that my participation as an artist in a mission such as that of colors of freedom uh, holds the same potential that the art itself will hopefully evoke a response in the people who are being asked to support these causes that makes them recognize that, you know, this whole notion that there is no separation between myself and another, and that where we have the opportunity to serve whatever is given to us in the way of an opportunity to serve, we must respond to. Um, so I, it is my hope that, that my art will help evoke that kind of response in the world. Hi everybody, welcome back. So the painting in between us now is As Above, So Below. This is Patricia's painting for the Bridging Heaven Earth Art Project. So another just powerful example. Why don't you talk a little about how you know that got expressed through you and you know anything you want to say about it because it's obviously just such a you know, an amazing piece again. Thank you, Alan. Um, most of my work is based on sacred geometry and I am very much in an awareness of the sort of architecture of the landscape and how the benefits of knowledge that has been basically of the esoteric mystery schools has had such an impact on us. And a lot of what you will see here is, for example, I use a, a, a palette that incorporates a lot of the old French master techniques. And this particular piece is a work on paper which is on uh, oil on paper, and then I have it lush mounted, and it looks like it is actually on canvas. Um, trying to incorporate all of the different elements of the world of the fire, water, air, and allowing us to see within those color fields, as above, so below, the energies that enter the earth, uh, using a little bit of tachyon physics theory, um, superluminal particles, and then going back seated through the center of the core of the earth where Mother Gaia needs to do her healing and then allow it to be re-released back into uh, the neutrinos of, of water. And of course, with all of the, the world right now going through change with water and how important water is on this planet and how sacred we need to keep water, I feel that uh, as above, so below is so relevant to bridging heaven and earth because we do need to keep 
things very, very focused and, and, and make great efforts ecologically and within ourselves. Wow. Yeah, it really expresses that. I was just going to say exactly the same thing. But no. <laughs> so, you were talking before about like, you know, there was like a time when art was really specifically sacred. Mm -hmm. You know, it was made, that was its intention. And we seem to be, we moved into maybe a more commercial. Do you see a shift back where people are wanting to hang vibrations of sacredness, wanting to hang vibrations of love in their home, in their office? Absolutely. Um, I think there's been a really important movement in the, in the commercial art business toward being able to um, provide interesting and important images in giclée and print form uh, so that more and more people could actually take home because a the piece price as the price points yeah. drop down, right. right. But at the same time, um, it's become such a mass market that the, the, it's, it's, the people are, are being flooded with all kinds of images that some of which, frankly, you know, we can get into a whole discussion sometime about art that is, is uh, genuinely um, uh, technically proficient but also emotionally evocative and, you know, compared to art that is simply about the object and not really um, intended, and this is no criticism, but it's not intended to serve any other function but, but to be a decorative piece element in, in, in a room. Um, and I think that what, I, what I'm finding, it's not what I think, I'm, what I am indeed finding when people come to the studio to, to look at my work, is that there is this, this response, this yearning and this response that's going on for work that um, uh, truly is about something other than just, as I said before, the object on the wall. Um, there are people who, I've been working with lately in Cleveland who just wanted a piece of one of my works for a long, long time. And, the, and it was just, you know, it was, it was out of sight in terms of the price for them. But when I started doing some things, took the intention that the work should be in the homes with people who had a passion for it, uh, and, that, and that happened, their response was so powerful that you knew that they had this yearning going on for something profound in their lives for a long, long time. And the picture was just really a manifestation of yes, that or an embodiment. Yes, that's right. And I see this in the case of Patricia's work as well. I see how people respond to it. And I actually own one of Patricia's paintings as I had that kind of response myself. Um, I find Patricia's work very much about doorways. As I, that's what I bring to it. These are portals, portals these, mm -hmm. yeah, these Different boundaries, levels. the boundaries that are but are not. You know, they, they, they appear to be seemingly seeming, yes. And, and then and yet the colors are so rich and, and inviting that when those boundaries dissolve and I go into a different place with her work. Um, that's kind of a long answer. But yes, there's definitely a search um, inspiration going on in the world right now. And art is just visual art is just one of the many things that can help people move within that search to another place. Because, yeah, I mean, you know, we get all different types of guests from all over the world, and, and they say they're really experiencing wherever they go a tremendous hunger to know, mm -hmm. a really tremendous hunger to experience that open heart, like you were talking about earlier, mm -hmm. that connection, not the separate, you know, the separation of state and, you know, all the ways we separate each other. Yes. I just, they're not enough anymore. Right. You know, and, you know, why don't you talk to them? But I, I also... In terms of what happens with the money, when you're talking about, you know, the value, intrinsically, we are in fact responsible as artists to look at not only what we benefit from, but it's a redistribution of the wealth, and our messages have to be very clear that we are in fact seeding back and fueling back into the world the benefits by virtue of the wisdom, by virtue of the interpretation, and then also what we do with the financial aspect because we are in fact responsible, fully committed to making sure that certainly the government looks after and there are assistance and social things in place. However, on a personal and individual basis, each of us needs to put back and refuel our economy and also take part in the ownership of we do not own anything, we are not attached to anything. So that ball of fire that we believe belongs to us only touches our fingers to burn them so that we can quickly release it back. So that energy within us actually gets dispersed and redispersed and we feel it. If you look at what's transpired with our weather right now, with Katrina, with the tsunami, many, many people, countries are having to deal with 
the financial purse and the redistribution. No longer is money being fueled to fight war, but in fact, the messages are now we must help our country of Pakistan. We must help our, our friends and neighbors. So we are, in fact, I believe, assessing and reassessing what we thought we had ownership of, and it's being completely taken away from us, whether we like it or not. Do you see a dichotomy on some level, a seeming dichotomy in that war still going on and there are bombs still being dropped, even in the light of these natural disasters and these service to, you know, our brothers and sisters all over the planet? It won't, it won't stop. I don't think it's going to change until Mother Nature, until the impact of all, and if you go back to the Mayan calendar, the prophecies, 2010, 2012, you know, there are earth changes underneath the earth, underneath the ocean. We have two active volcanoes right now. You know, the, the global warming isn't just taking place because we've done something up in the air. And global warming is actually seeing the oceans being warmed. And in fact, what transpires may or may not be fully within our academic or education process, but there is no question that the, the players on the outside, on the, on the layer of the crust of the earth, they're going to be dropped. They, they will have no choice. And you mean dropped in what way? Mother Nature will take over and... and There'll be a cleansing and redistributing right. of lands and things like that. And, and people have said that, you know, by certain actions we take that some of that can be alleviated or uh, lessened. I mean, because I remember back in the 60s there were, you know, you know, talk of like Denver being a port city, which in California would be either an island or mm -hmm. somewhat underwater. It'd be harder to shoot a show, actually, that way, but <laughs> as, as we probably could guess. And that didn't happen, and the theory was is because more light was coming into the planet through all the, mm -hmm. you know, people and all the things like that. And even now, I think the theory is that these Earth changes were go, are happening, but they will, theoretically, the intention perhaps was even to happen worse. I think that, that it begs the question that all of this, you know, we, we're, we're here to talk about one, that there really is no difference among all beings and all manifestation. So we have to look at what is our responsibility individually and collectively in these phenomena that are wrapping the planet right now. Um, I just simply pose the question for consideration that the, the degree of destruction and, and negativity that is out there. It just It's not just that the ego manifests itself in bad television and, and, and other ways like that, but actually in the natural f biology and, and botany and the physics of the world, that the sense of separation that we maintain as egos is in fact creating the literal contraction of the planet. The and dislocation. The of dislocation of the planet, right. And, and that by what we've been talking about here, these, these efforts and, and good, good impulses and intuitions and intentions to actually manifest unity, um, the unity that transcends everything, that that is essential to the whole shift in, in planetary health and um, global warming and everything is tied into that. I, I just feel it in my bones. I really do. And, and we were talking earlier, I mean, I mean, do you see in your travels, I know you travel quite a bit, uh, that there is a, besides a longing, a real both intention. See, we see it in terms of more and more people want to collaborate. You know, th there was all these separations before and between, sp even in the spiritual, what we would call the New Age of spiritual community, and now people are recognizing that unless we come together co collaboratively, joyously, lovingly, mm -hmm. that what you're talking about is not going to be healed, that the heart is not going to be healed. And the, mm -hmm. if the heart is not healed and the root is not healed, you know, we could deal with a leaf over here and a leaf over here and save a dolphin here and that disharmony will just kill a rainforest <laughs> over here. You know, that's just its nature. So how do we heal the heart? Do you see that as really oh, a, a movement now? I think that the borders that we've crossed over on a spiritual level have absolutely changed and have moved eons in a very short period of time and for example i had an exhibition in zurich we were in the congress house and i was beside minju lee of, of uh, south korea and i have now had the opportunity to exhibit by virtue of being a, a friend with minju lee 
and it, and my work now is in Korea, in South Korea. And then you look at what is taking place in North and South Korea. So those those opportunities for people to make changes and be aware. Technologically, we are obviously much more aware. We have the opportunity to, you know, harmoniously now know what's going on in Africa. Uh, for example, with Free the Children, Craig and Mark Kilberger um, have been in there building schools. And the education process is what really does significantly make us become more aware because they're going in there bringing books, they're bringing opportunities for people to see what has transpired in North America and all of a sudden they're looking back and saying, whoa, perhaps we, the lesson we need to learn is that what they have, the old ways, need to be honored. So in that awareness, we're now saying, okay, the traditions and the old wisdom has to remain in place, but how can we help them actually take integrity from it so that they can survive? And that gets into all different social complicated issues of you know Africa and, and more, but I think that collaboration is really making a very significant and positive difference. And what we find is that people are, you know, clearly open to it, like, you know, that all the separations really from for a lot of people are, are literally too stupid anymore. <laughs> And, and, and too hindering, mm -hmm. you know, the, the passion and the hunger is so strong that, you know, the barriers just almost in a way have to fall because they've been pre they're preventing the healing of the heart and, you know, the heart has such a longing now. And then, but there's also great, there are great forces working against that, as, as you know, and, and, you know, in this relatively dark time, uh, as the heart becomes more manifested, we should expect, because we are in the place of, of ego and, and the mortal state, that that, uh, that resistance will increase even as the light increases. And so it may be some time, I think, before we see a sort of an equanimity established with any kind of stability uh, in this realm, in this place. And, you know, I, I don't know what that means ultimately, but we still have some things to go through. And I also think that it's important to remember when we talk about art as, as serving a transcendent function and, and, and working collaboratively with these social issues, that it's really, really a wonderful grace that we can sit here and we can have this conversation. We have food on the table and we have roofs over our heads and we have, we have all these things that enable us to have free There's attention a, and energy. There's a lot of luck going on in Cleveland, so you don't <laughs> but you do have it here. We yeah. have free yeah. attention and energy. Right and you know a significant portion of the six billion that inhabit this planet um, don't have the food or the water or the shelter and they can't even begin to consider spiritual life in the sense of what we've been discussing uh, when they have to be focused on survival and so those of us who have means and ability uh, i really believe we need to put that at the service of enlarging the capacity of the world to do this very kind of conversation and, and don't you both see that that really is happening more? That, yeah. that that openness and that open heart is serving where it needs to serve? You know, without distinction, without differentiation, it's just, you know, where does, where does love need to manifest? Mm -hmm. More and more people are now traveling to China, Peru, Egypt, India, because they're seeking, they're thirsting for the old knowledge to, to know and understand how they can learn the techniques in their truth. And a year, a year and a half ago, I had the opportunity of receiving my Abhisaka blessing from Master Yutian John of the Hanmi Esoteric Mystery School. And again, you envelop and embrace all of that. But the opportunity would never have come if he hadn't for the first time come from China, from Mongolia to, to Canada. Yeah, no, it's amazing how like, yeah, people are coming where it needs to go. Mm -hmm. Okay, one last thing, 10 seconds, go. I think that it's really just very, very important to remember that there is no difference. There is no separation in the physics of things. There is no difference at all between you sitting there and me sitting here and Patricia here and that painting. And that we have to fundamentally realize it, not just have a concept about it, do more than simply believe, but prove it in our own experience. Okay, you know, it just... Another show has gone by, another show about love, another show about oneness. If you want any information about Kathy, Patricia, what they're doing, where they're doing it, Colors of Freedom, Bridging Heaven and Earth, call Alan, 805-687-2053. Good night. We love you. 
really, it's an opportunity for us all to heal the heart, to open the heart, and be in joy and love. Good night. God bless you. Thank you.